Yeah, I mean, I, I think losing an ecosystem has so many more impacts uh, than, than we even realise. I mean, there's not only the footprint of losing the ecosystem, it's really around what that ecosystem did in time and place and, and, and the impact that it had. And it's really difficult to understand the magnitude of that, the lasting impacts of that, until it's gone. Seeing an ecosystem in front of your eyes disappear, which has this huge amount of grief and this emotional drain on people. There's so much going on in the world in terms of the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, that, you know, to see an ecosystem, a community disappear, that's just another thing. And people start to despair. You know, they have this, uh, this concept of ecological grief where there is this this grieving when they know that something is being lost and i don't think it's just about loss to us it's about loss to generations coming the challenge that we have is like we didn't know about this loss or we've not seen it through time it's happened over generations but you know i think what we do is we we're able to shift that grief to shift that loss to being something positive that people can actually be like this is what was here, what was sustaining livelihoods, what was sustaining First Nations, and it can be back there. One of the biggest challenges, I think, in our journey in beginning this project and growing this project was really understanding the scale of the loss. And as we began to understand that a little bit more, uh, we began to connect with people more and really share those stories around uh, how the ecosystem was lost, why it was lost, uh, and really just that whole removal uh, from an entire ecosystem from, from people's lives. It's a big unknown story for most Australians that we had extensive oyster reefs, mussel beds throughout most bays and estuaries. And these were often wiped out before living memory of most of us. Um, this is sort of a, a process that happened well beyond our ecological memory. So bringing something back at this scale is really important. Um, oyster reefs, mussel beds are incredibly important as water filters, as ecosystem drivers, and to get them back in many bays and estuaries, what we want to do. So to bring it back at that scale seems really important. If we get to 60, this would bring uh, a critically endangered ecosystem back off that critically endangered list. This is the last remaining Angazi habitat that we know of that's relatively undisturbed. As a marine biologist, it's a dream to be involved in something like this where you're, you're recovering an ecosystem. You know it was there. Uh, what makes it even better is you actually have this still existing so that you can compare the work that you're doing to and you know when you reach success because you've got a benchmark to measure everything against. The oyster reef was as far as your eye could see. You'd be there, you would be hovering about a metre above the surface and it's, it's, it's expansive, it's flat, but once you get down and into the detail, it, it's actually quite deep in some areas. So there's obviously decades, potentially hundreds of years of oysters growing on top of oysters, forming this oyster reef. I think compared to some of those other charismatic 
ecosystems. You got your colorful coral reef, you got your giant kelp forests. It's the color and the structure that you see there. Many people who would see video of a shellfish reef would be like, well, looks like the sea floor. But then you look closer and it's all these oysters that are filtering. It's this living, almost like this living organism where all these all these marine creatures of the same species have come together and decided to live in this one place. They're creating these ecosystem services that benefit everybody and benefit themselves. You know, this is as good as anything that you'll get on the Great Barrier Reef. They're just not flashy about it. They're the unassuming oysters. This is what we want our native flat oyster reefs to recover and to look like, to be able to dive it, to touch it and feel it, and to see the species living and breathing on this reef was truly special. Temperate Australian waters are really unique. About 80% of our fish species, um, different marine life is only found here in our southern waters. Um, unlike our tropical waters, which have a lot of shared biodiversity with our neighbours in Indonesia and Melanesia and the like, southern Australia is really unique. So we wanted to focus on conservation efforts here that can make a real difference. And what we actually did, we asked scientists, policymakers, practitioners, where best might the Conservancy work to solve some of the biggest challenges. And collectively they said that places like estuaries, bays, inlets should be a priority. These were often the grey areas between land managers and sea managers, um, often fell between the policy cracks, but also were really important in terms of nursery grounds for our fish and other species. And they're often very close to population, so people knew and loved these places, but had big conservation challenges. So there's two types of native species of oyster which are being incorporated into the reefs. In the intertidal area, which is the area that's exposed at low tide, there's the Sydney rock oyster, which is, is farmed and is one of those um, premium products of the oyster industry on the New South Wales South Coast. The other species that we're using for the reefs is Engazi, also known as native flat or mud oysters, and they occur subtidally. What we're doing is trying to create natural biogenic reefs where the shellfish that, um, that we seed onto the reefs will eventually naturally produce their own reef substrate and, and create a three-dimensional structure with time that will be self-sustaining. So the first step was to find a population of those Australian flat oysters. So we collected those individuals and then we took them to a hatchery facility in Queenscliff. They got those adults to release their larvae, which were then settled onto a recycled shells that have been collected from restaurants around Melbourne. Uh, they grow them out onto those, those shells and then we bring them back out here onto the reefs and place them onto the rocks to kickstart that process. The impact on this harbour from people taking from it's been, been uh, stressed to the max over the last um, uh, you know, hundred or so years because of the impact of people and colonisation. So anything that's putting back into this particular harbour was certainly welcomed by our community. Yeah. And involving more and more of our knowledge in the actual project itself as well. Um, because traditionally it's a very important location for us and remains so. And it's, I think our knowledge and our understanding, we're, we're happy to share that because um, our cultures were based on the sharing of knowledge and, and also um, creating understanding through that process. Since the Nature Conservancy has been constructing shellfish reefs, we've always had Kangaroo Island as a flagship site. What we know is that there were oyster reefs in the sheltered bays and estuaries. And we know this from historic fishing records as well as talking to the local community. So we wanted to bring back the oysters to a place where they once existed. It's so exciting that we finally, with the support of the federal government, been able to put these reefs back in the water so that they is a pristine, clean marine environment and is a place where fishers and divers can enjoy. I 
After the fires, there was a real effort here to try and recover from an agricultural point of view, from a community point of view, from a trauma and mental health point of view. And you ask, how does it help? How does it fit in? Well, I think it's just another example of how, uh, as an island, we must look after the land and the sea, and this coastal environment is really important for us. And these reef restorations is really trying to put back some of the habitat that's been lost over the years. And I think as we go into the next sort of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, reefs like this will really prove their, their value. The biggest single challenge is really the newness of the approach. Uh, marine restoration, coastal restoration in the water hasn't been done at a large scale in Australia. So often we are breaking new ground, um, working with state governments, local governments in doing this in the, in the coastal waters. So I guess bringing that newness of approach, bringing the newness of the science, working with planning authorities to get the job done, which will hopefully open up restoration into the future at a much larger scale. Climate change is a big threat to our marine environment, so shellfish reefs um, will help by providing habitat for fish, filtering water, and making sure that um, these coastlines are resilient long into the future. Since fires, there has been a couple of things like where they, you know, they're trying to eradicate feral animals, and, and now the oyster reefs, it's just like steps forward that don't often see, especially with the environment. Like, it's always, oh, this is dying, or, you know, this is disappearing, and yeah, with the oyster reef, it's like another step forward with the kangaroo owners. Just, yeah, it's really hopeful. So our ambition is to get to 60 reefs by 2030, but really we want to see many more than that. And the best case scenario is that it's not just the Nature Conservancy doing the work, it's local councils, it's natural resource management agencies, it's the local community doing this as part of, you know, everyday life in seeing that these systems are incredibly valuable from an ecological perspective, but also from the functions they provide and for healthy oceans and healthy communities. The contractors that build these reefs actually are generally marine contractors. They're large construction projects on site with large construction equipment and that's a significant cost and that money comes back into the local economy because they're obviously a locally based contractor. Our whole career is based on the marine industry and if the ecosystem falls apart, so do our jobs. Um, so to be able to actually give back, it's the, best, you know, it's the best thing about the job to say that we built that and it's improving the water quality. This project itself is, you know, the reintroduction of a, of a shellfish back into the harbour and I think that's really, really important. Um, if we, we come back here in, in four or five years time and see um, the, the waterway in, in a better condition, I think that for us, is, is, um, for us all as a community is, is of benefit, great benefit. It's amazing to see almost in front of your eyes these, the ecosystem start to develop. So you have the fish, you have these invertebrates, you have the crabs, the brightly coloured doughboy scallops, the sponges and the seaweeds, as well as the oysters and the mussels forming this complex three-dimensional shape, which, you know, if we hark back to what we think of as the reference ecosystem down in George's Bay, Tasmania, yeah, you know, it's almost very much looking like that. From small beginnings, we've gone to scale and the future looks really bright. The reefs are recovering, the fish species that are coming back are, are incredible. I think I've said before, it's a marine biologist's dream to be able to see this happening in, in front of your eyes.